Go ahead. Yeah. Right? Uh, I asked Kat, there are, let me begin. There are, in this country, three, not one, not two, but three performing rights organizations, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. And uh, for, for our purposes, the two, the two main ones that we deal with, the kind of concert music stuff we're talking about are ASCAP and BMI. And performing rights organizations are the groups that collect the money from your performances. You, you know, money is generated when your music is performed. And they collect the money from licenses that are paid to them from venues and ensembles, etc. And then the money is paid out to the writers and the publishers. And so I want to make sure that everybody in this room who is a composer, which is you know, all of you guys, are a member of a performing rights organization. I am particularly fond of ASCAP, <laughs> who is uh, sponsoring my, my visit to you today. But they are both wonderful organizations, and um, we need to join one or the other to be paid for your performances. In addition, uh, ASCAP in particular has something called the ASCAP Plus Award, which is every year you can uh, have your, your career activities and concerts and performances reviewed, and uh, they will often give you a small amount of money to compensate for things that haven't been credited in your royalties. So that's a very nice thing, and it's called the ASCAP Plus Award. So anyway, go on to either you know, ASCAP.com or BMI.com and join. And you want to join not only as a composer member, but if you're serious about getting your music out into the world as a publisher member. Okay. So do you understand how, how performing rights organizations work? Yeah. I have a bit of a question about that. Um, so like if I wrote music for a, a YouTube video um, and that was somehow generating funding uh, for the people, and then I also got paid by the director or whatever. Um, do you know if a uh, performing rights organization, like if I registered the music that I wrote with them, should they just be, how does that work out? Well, it doesn't work very well with um, YouTube, obviously. I'm not sure what the licensing is. YouTube is supposed to pay something, but I have yet to see YouTube monies. I'm not sure how that is. Really good. <laughs> I'm, I'm better equipped to talk about you know, performances and things, mm -hmm. live and concert performances, but um, I can certainly find out more about the YouTube thing. I should know more than I do. Uh, but basically, <coughs> we're all screwed. <laughs> that's, a, that's a short name. Um, but, but yeah, when your music is performed, you are generating money from it. You're making, your music is making money. Here's another <coughs> concept for you. Your music is making money for other people. You know, when a venue hosts a concert, they sell tickets. And they make a profit, ideally, from the sale of those tickets. The content of the concert is why people are buying the tickets. The content is, in part, yours, if you're on the program. When a restaurant has music in the background playing, as almost every restaurant you've ever been to does, that music is enhancing what the restaurant is giving as a product. People are paying to be in that restaurant. The restaurant is making money off of the ambiance, just like they have to pay for the vase on the table, and they have to pay for the flower in the vase, and they have to pay for the tablecloth. Guess what? Your music is just as important, if not more so, as the vase and the, and the flower. Understand this conceptually. This is a very groundbreaking concept from, you know, Richard Herbert a long time ago, 100 years ago. Actually, it is ASCAP's 100th um, anniversary now, this year. And this is the concept that our music is being used by other people to make money for their pursuits. And so as a result, we deserve to be paid something for that. And that's the concept in, in shorthand on of royalties. So it's very important for you guys to see money from the performances of your music, especially at a college or university. All you have to do is submit the program. You know, to, to, you send in the program with online registration, um, and you know, and, and they see what's going on. Uh, it starts with title registration in, for either society, uh, where you have to go online and and basically register. Once you're elected as a member, uh, you go online and you register. You let them know about every piece of music you've written in your catalog, and then from that, then you can then uh, report which ones that you know about are being performed. So you might get a little bit of money each year from doing that, which would be really nice. And then as your careers grow, you'll get more than a little bit of money. 
And for those of you, for instance, that are songwriters, let's say, where there's a little bit more chance for bigger money, uh, if something hits, just say, if you if you write a song and it gets out there and suddenly, you know, Faith Hill or Lyle Lovett, who I'm going to go see tonight, uh, decide to record it, ka-ching, 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 but it's only ka-ching because if you're being paid, you know, your royalties through, uh, through ASCAP and BMI. So you want, you want definitely to, to become a member. Okay, so while we're on the subject of, of uh, tedious business stuff, let me go through, at least cursorily, um, Jim Kendrick's wonderful uh, primer on copyright. And we don't have to spend pages on this, but I, and no one can do this better and describe it better than Jim, who, as I said before, is an incredible attorney, um, very, very knowledgeable. But I can at least go over the copyright basics with you guys. And I'll do this fairly quickly. But I want you to understand your asset which is your copyright. I want you to understand it. Okay, a copyright is a legal device by which the U.S. government protects creators, that's you guys, and me too, by giving them certain exclusive rights. The rights and the limitations on them are discussed in the next questions. In their works, for a limited period of time, because these rights can be valuable, a copyright owner can obtain payment if someone else wishes to use their work. Moreover, these rights also include certain rights to stop a use, very important guys, protecting the copyright, to which the copyright owner objects. Very important concept. Okay, the US copyright law presumes that the creator of a work is the original owner of the copyright in that work. The only exception is if the work is a work made for hire, in which case the employer or, or the, uh, the actual creator is the original owner. Uh, for collaborative works, the US law gives joint ownership of the entire work to the creators. The creator owner can license others to use that work in various ways, such as perform or record, or the creator owner can enter into an arrangement with another party, such as a music publisher, who will promote, print, rent, and or license the work for use on behalf of the creator. So let's say in Hollywood, if you're doing, a, if you're scoring a picture, I can just about guarantee you that 99.9% of the time that is a work for hire, meaning you don't own the copyright to that music. You're being hired to contribute to you know, the film, and it's the uh, and the copyright is going to be owned by the producer of the film company or whoever else, but not you. <laughs> Whereas a concert music piece, for instance, is entirely yours. Yeah. Uh, but I think I haven't I heard from. Uh, I've heard from like television composers and I think a few film composers that if they release a CD, that the CD profits go to them. Is that true? Yeah, well, that's they get the writer's share of the music from that. That's a different use. Okay. Yeah, that's a different use. But for the for the same rights to the film, it's a work for hire. A creator doesn't have to do anything extra to obtain copyright protection. Copyright subsists in a work from the moment it's fixable in a tangible medium of, expre of expression. This is what we addressed earlier this morning. That is when it's embodied in printed copy, phono record, you know, an audio only uh, form, uh, film, TV, I mean, DVD, computer, hard disk, or flash memory device, or any other means by which it can be stored in a sufficiently stable form to allow it to be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated. Now, this is the nitty gritty. There are six rights of copyright, and I, I want you to wrap your heads around this because we tend to think of copyright as like one, one thing, but actually, contractually, there are a, a, a many different aspects to what it is that is owned. One, the right to reproduce the work in copies or phono records, which term includes all forms of audio recording, audio only recordings. Two, <coughs> the right to prepare derivative works, for example, songs or operas using texts by others, Choral arrangements, marching band versions, sound recordings of performances of the work. Three, the right to distribute copies or phono records of a work by any means, including sale, rental, lease, or loan. Four, the right to perform the copyrighted work publicly. That's a separate right. Five, the right to display the work publicly. And six, for sound recordings, the right to perform the work publicly by means of digital transmission. And uh, there are more things here. What's, what is a public performance or display? 
And the Copyright Act to perform or display publicly means, A, to perform or display a work in a place open to the public or where a substantial number of persons outside of a family and its normal circle of social acquaintances is gathered, <laughs> that's a funny line to me, um, such as theater or concert hall. <coughs> or B, to transmit or otherwise communicate a performance or display to a place described in A above or to the public by any device or process, including broadcasting, cable casting, satellite transmission, and digital transmission via the internet or otherwise, whether the public receives the performance at the same or different places and at the same or different times. Now, this is very important in this day and age. Uh, all television and radio broadcasting, as well as webcasting, is covered by this position, public performance or display. The performing rights societies license non-dramatic public performances, including opera, excerpts, excerpts. This is often the least expensive way to obtain performing rights for non-staged performances. The societies offer very low rates for benefit and other performances and events for which no admission is charged. So if you've got, if you're in an ensemble, let's say you and your friends are an ensemble, and you're going to put on a concert next Saturday at the local church, which does not have an ASCAP license, um, and it's not planning on getting one. So in order to put any music from an AS any ASCAP composer in the world on your program, you have to send, I think the minimum is 33 bucks. You gotta, you gotta pay, I, think, I believe it's 33 bucks, or $15 a performance, but I think the minimum for a year is $33, even if you're only gonna do one. Uh, goes into ASCAP to give you the right to perform that music. That money then goes into a pot, including if it's your money on the, uh, your music on the program, ironically, the money goes into a pot into ASCAP. ASCAP gets the perform the, the uh, program of the concert. They see the composer's pieces have been done, and they divvy out the money of the blanket license in general, you know, in, uh, uh, in appropriately. And that isn't to say that people only get part of thirty-three dollars; they get more than that, most likely. But it's that's the base. Fee, just to give you an idea. So it's not wildly expensive for an ensemble that to play in a non-licensed venue. If the venue is licensed, then you're home free because then the venue is taken care of, has taken care of paying that blanket license to ASCAP, and we composers then get paid from that money into the pot, and the ensemble doesn't have to pay anything. Only one payer has to pay. Only one payer has to pay into the license. What are the limitations on the exclusive rights? <clears throat> there are some significant limitations. The most important of these is the doctrine of fair use. Fair use is a legal concept which means that an unauthorized use of a copyrighted work, which otherwise would be an infringement of copyright, <coughs> would not be considered infringement because it is a use to which the copyright owner shouldn't object. And, and that's a very thorny concept. Clearly, they shouldn't. You know, this is either because the use does not impair the economic or artistic value of the work, or because it is one of overriding social value. Now, in a sense, these are all very subjective concepts when you really think about it. For example, the law suggests that a certain limited use, certain limited uses of copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news, reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research may be fair uses. However, this does not mean that, for example, a teacher is free to copy anything he or she wants to use in the classroom. Myth number one, numerical percentage guidelines. It is important to note that there are no numerical percentage guidelines in the law. There's nothing in the law that says that the use of a 30 second clip or a 50 word excerpt of a text is always fair use, regardless of the reason for using it. <coughs> and every situation is gonna be considered individually. Myth number two, Nonprofits. It's important to also know that there is no general fair use exemption for nonprofit organizations. For example, every organized orchestra, opera, and ballet company in the U.S. is a nonprofit organization, from the largest to the smallest. This is really important stuff. It's really interesting to hear this, isn't it? So that virtually every university, so is virtually every university and college, as well as many important theater companies, presenters, and venues. Obviously, composers and publishers would have had to stop creating and publishing concert music long ago if there was such an exemption. So just because something has nonprofit status, it doesn't mean that they're not making money, and it doesn't mean that they don't have to pay you for the use of your work. 
Again, your work is worth something. So don't let anybody ever say to you guys, oh, we're a nonprofit. You know, you should give this to us free. Chances are they're a nonprofit who's paying the caterer and paying the, the, the wait staff and paying their staff and paying the this and the that, right? You know, it's just like with <coughs> film music and films. People say, oh, you know, I need you to write this score for free, you know, but uh, it'll be good for you. Write the score for free. And they've already shot a film for, let's say, $70,000, some small little budget thing, but it's still 70 grand. They still had to buy the tape. They still had to pay the grip. They still had to pay all sorts of people who worked on that film. And somehow they think that they don't have to pay the composer. Wrong, 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 wrong. If, they, if you do end up doing a film, I'm t taking off on this for a second, just it struck my fancy. If you guys end up doing uh, a film which has a budget of any note, I mean more than a couple grand, you know, a real budget. If, if you work on something that has a budget, and if you do decide to work on it for free, out of the goodness of your heart, hoping that it will lead to something, or at least be great on your reel, all of which could be true, try to see if you can get a producer credit, because guess what? You're investing in the film. You're now an investor, okay? When you give something, in a business situation, I'm not talking about friends and loved ones to whom we should give completely and always, but in a business situation, when you're giving something, if you choose to give something of worth, try to get something back that will be useful to you, or will at least give, a, give the idea to the person to whom you're giving this gift that what you're giving has value. You understand the concept there? You know, make, make, make it a balanced kind of giving. It should, because so much of what goes on, especially in a lot of this Hollywood stuff, is take, take, take. You know, who's going to give me this for free? And, and you know, they, they're not going to give anything to anybody. So that's, that's an important little sidetrack I wanted to uh, get going on because of the nonprofit thing. Fair use factors. If the US copyright law says that if an alleged infringer claims as his defense, to that a use is fair, a court is to consider the facts and circumstances of the individual case, including the following four factors. One, the purpose and character of the use, including whether such use is of commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Two, the nature of the copyrighted work. Three, the amount and substanti substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. And the effect of the use upon the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work. Although four factors must be considered, most fair, uses case, fair use cases are determined by answering the question posed by the fourth factor. Is the use complained of one which the copyright owner justifiably expects to be paid for? For example, in the case of material published specifically for the educational market, a US court should be more willing to protect the copyright owner from large-scale photocopying of, say, a, a complete choral arrangement by a school than <coughs> if the work in question were a few pages from a long symphonic score. But these cases are not always predictable. And you understand the logic in that. You know. <coughs> Similarly, uses of uh, excerpts of copyright of dramatic <coughs> works, such as musical plays or operas, could be fair use if, in, if used in reviews of the performance, but not necessarily to sell tickets to DVDs. The use by a composer or publisher of an archival recording by a union orchestra to promote additional performances of a work is considered a violation of the union agreement with the orchestra management and cannot be excused on the grounds of fair use. And I'm sure you've heard lots of things about unions, and one thing they are, one thing they are, is very, very tough when it comes to reuses of their of material, of union contract material. So the golden rule, don't take more of someone else's work than you would be happy for them to take of yours. And consider that, for many reasons, others may be more protective of their work than you are of yours. Think of unions with obligations to their members, publishers with duties to their composers and heirs. Other important limitations include compulsory licenses for the making of commercial phonorecords for distribution to the public for private use and for certain educational television uses. By the way, phonorecords is a very old-fashioned term, but that is the legal term for, any, for audio, basically. You know, uh, it's always funny to see that word. Limited right, rights to copy works for library and archival uses and certain cable television uses. In each case, Congress has tried to balance the rights of the copyright owner against the rights of the public to obtain access to copyrighted works on an economically reasonable basis. How can you be sure? 
<laughs> how can you be sure? Get right to uh, Let's see what the rest of that one. How can you be sure a use is not infringing? Information <laughs> for all rights holders, including the copyright owner of the musical work and all performers and other creative team members directly via Union Guild. One of the things that I neglected to say when I was talking about YouTube and videos and stuff you put up on your web, audio clips and audio and video, um, do your very best to just, in a casual email, you don't have to have a legal agreement, I mean, I'm sure Jim would say, oh, it would be great if you did, but at least get in writing some agreement to saying, hi, you know, um, Carlos, you did such a great job, you know, on my, on my Sonata last weekend, I'd love to put either a snippet or maybe even the whole thing up on uh, YouTube or my website or Facebook. Um, is that a credit, fully credited, of course. Never, don't credit somebody. Is that okay with you? And, and he'll probably say, sure, but he has the right to say no. You know, um, but hopefully, you know, your performers will say yes. But do the, this is good etiquette in addition to whatever legal protections it is for you. It's also a really good community building thing and works in your favor to be back in touch with the musicians who did something uh, with your work and to and to uh, be in touch with them and say, wow, I really liked that because if you didn't, you wouldn't be using it. You know, I really liked that and I'd like to use an excerpt uh, on Facebook or tweet it or put it on my website, is that cool with you? You know, ask them. And, and again, make sure to credit them. And if you can, credit them with links to their own websites. That's even nicer for their Facebook or wherever you want. Like, linkage is everything, right? So, try to get permission. <laughs> ask. At least you'll know where you stand. Asking permission does not weaken your position that the use may actually be fair. In the U.S., there's a statutory compulsory license of mechanical rights after the first recording. Uh, the compulsory license includes the right to arrange the composition to suit the style of the performer, but the arrangement must not change the fundament fundamental character of the composition or add lyrics to a non-lyrical work. That's a very big deal. For physical copies and permanent downloads, um, the rate, I think this is still the current rate, the rate, the rate changes, by the way, from time to time. The rate for each composition is 1.75 cents per minute per copy, with a minimum fee per copy of 9.1 cents for recordings of five minutes or less. For example, now we're talking mechanical, so this is like CDs, you know, for sales of CDs and things. For example, the statutory mechanical rate for a 30-minute act would be 52.5 cents per copy. The statutory mechanical for a four-minute aria, on the other hand, would be 9.1 cents per copy. Big difference. The Harry Fox Agency licenses mechanical rights at the statutory rate in many, but by no means all, compositions for manufacturing and distribution of audio. For instance, I'm not with Harry Fox. You know, I do it myself. A lot of composers and publishers do it themselves, but that's a big agency that handles a lot of it. Copyright owners are not required to use HFA in any license individually. HFA song file allows licensees to make limited pressings of under 2,500 copies of any composition owned by an HFA affiliate publisher for a fat, flat service fee of $13 per song, plus the statutory mechanical license fee for each copy sold. Often, even HFA affiliated publishers will license small pressings, pressings directly. One thing that I do, for instance, in some contracts for recording, um, I'll get a recording contract from an ensemble that clearly has no budget, and, you know, whatever, and nice people who just decided to do a lovely recording of my piece on a little indie label that's going to sell, you know, 312 copies probably, right? And I will, I will waive the um, uh, mechanical fees, uh, which would end up on, let's say, for my length of piece, maybe they would end up to be 100 bucks of, of fees if I were lucky. Instead, what I'll say to them, and I've never had a problem with this. Um, I'll say, I'm happy to wait with these, but I'll tell you what, um, how about you send me eight CDs? And they're happy to send me the CDs, and guess what? I can then turn around and sell the CDs with my recording on my website for 15 bucks a piece, right? Guess what? I've just made more money than I would on the mechanical license. Get it? Entrepreneurial thinking <laughs> that you're not likely to see the mechanicals on, you know, on this, but you are much more likely to be able to sell you know, get direct results from selling, selling it. I mean, this is good for small potatoes thing. If we were dealing with huge numbers, I wouldn't be so cavalier about it. But this is a good work, real life working example of something that I've done you know, many times. That, you know, when they send me CDs, that's, that's valuable to me. 
first of all, of course, they're always going to send you at least one copy, you know, as soon as happen. But then they, they send you more, and you can sell them. Alex? Yeah? I was going to ask, do you send, on the same note, do you send out all the recordings to radio stations? Yes, um, absolutely. I used to do that a lot, uh, uh, aggressively. And the great news now is, here's another thing to wrap your heads around, which you probably know, I think if I were talking to an older audience, they'd need to wrap their brains around this harder. But it used to be that you'd wait till you had a whole album, and then you'd make a big, make a big deal about the album, right? And that's like, that's the model that we all grew up with, all of us in this room. But I hope you know, that's no longer really the way business is being done. People are <coughs> downloading and listening to tracks at a time. And sometimes, regrettably, that means your three movement symphony is being, you know, dealt, bought, you know, one track at a time, too. But nonetheless, what I have found early on, uh, even before this became the norm, I started sending, the minute I had a recording, a commercial recording of something, that I knew would eventually end up on my CD, to which I would own the master, own the, meaning the rights of that recording, the copyright of that recording, the master recording. I knew I owned it, I knew I, you know, I had paid for the studio time, the musicians, whatever, there was nobody uh, that was owed money. So I would contact uh, you know, radio stations, etc., with just that one piece. And they were very, very happy always to take it, play it, whatever. And what that does is it builds buzz. You know, it gets, it keeps you in on the radio while you're doing the other pieces. And then finally, yes, you end up with an album. But still, people are pretty much going to just download the tracks that they want. I mean, that's what we all do a lot of the time. And I, try, I try to support artists and buy the whole album uh, as much as possible. But once in a while, uh, especially with, with a lot of pop stuff, I'll just buy a couple of tracks. And you know, this is, for better or for worse, I'm not saying it's a great thing artistically, because we used to love album concepts, right? Whether it was rock music or classical, there'd be a reason for the programming and curation of those pieces. It would take you on a journey. And now we're, we're not in that world. And so I highly recommend that when you have one good, one good piece, good recording, don't hold off getting that out there to people. Get that out there. Get spin it. Spin it. Get it on Facebook. Get it on in radio stations. Let people hear what you're doing and what you sound like. There's no downside to that. Um, okay. Does statutory compulsory license does not apply to recordings of dramatic musical works, uh, like opera, musical theater. For such works, rates are individually negotiated. Uh, these are called uh, grand rates, by the way. However, as a practical matter, the statutory rate is often applied. Publishers often will charge recording rental fees for the use of scores and parts for a recording. Uh, basically, I'm, I'm not sure if it gets into this on the slide, and we're not going to go through every single one of them at this point, because you, you get the idea of the kind of controls that you have. But you know, there's small rights and there's grand rights. So uh, ASCAP and BMI do not license opera and musical theater and, and, and ballet. Those are those are multimedia, visual, staged things. And you, as the publisher, uh, or whoever your publisher is, negotiates those based usually on some interesting formula of what the ticket prices are, <coughs> how many seats there are in the house, and how many performances there are going to be. And you come up with some uh, fair assessment of how many hundreds of bucks per performance or whatever you're going to get paid. So that's how they're done. Uh, let me jump through this, because I know this gets a bit dry a bit, or it gets all interesting, but it's not always, not as um, relative. So, unlike the copyright laws in the EU, member states and some other countries, the US copyright law does not contain a specific making available right covering internet uses. Instead, online uses are considered to fall within one or more of the reproduction, distribution, and public performance rights. So anyway, I could go on, but I think you get the idea. <coughs> the thing with copyrights is that you also you want to, you do want to protect your work. And, here, and here's an example: um, if if an organization that you vehemently whose views you vehemently with whose views you, do, you vehemently disagree, if an organization wants to uh, use your music for you know, their 30-minute uh, PSA ad, for something that you really, really don't agree with. 
Um, chances are probably pretty good that you're going to say no. You're going to say, no, I don't want to be associated with that. And you have the right to do that. It's very powerful that you don't, your art does not have to be tethered to something you don't want it tethered to. So, you know, you have control. You can't, you can't assume that everybody is always going to be fine with every use of their work. And I know a lot of people who, who get much more livid than I would about arrangements being done in their music, for example. Um, like, Mar it's very common for marching bands to do arrangements. And sadly, it's too common for them not to get licenses. They just, you know, pick a piece off the shelf that they really like, and some guy goes in the back room and comes out a few days later with this groovy marching band thing, 350 people down on the field playing away, and guess what? They have to pay for that. Because maybe the composer doesn't want to hear their lovely little ode to Debussy done, you know, for marching band. Maybe, I think it would be hilarious personally, but, you know, I'm, I'm more easygoing than the average composer. <coughs> Many composers would be appalled. I know a lot of composers who are very strict about what they will allow to be adapted and arranged. And you guys all have this power. So you know, we all have this power to be um, protected over what, what happens to our art. What happens to the intellectual property that came out of our brains and our hearts and goes out there into the world? It is not for everybody else to mutilate. It's for us to give them permission to mutilate if they want. But, it's, but other people can't just do it because they want to. So, I am no copyright expert by far. Um, here you go, you know, life plus 70. Uh, so, this is all stuff that you can look up online too, you know, how long is copyright. ASCAP has some stuff on its site, I would imagine BMI does as well. Um, so, you know, this gets into all the nitty gritty of damages, et cetera. So anyway, I hope this is helpful. This is a quick overview. Um, Jim, when Jim does this, he, he's just so brilliant, and you know, it'll take him an hour <laughs> to go through all this stuff. So there you have it. Okay. Now, what I want to cover. We haven't gone into depth about web and kind of social media etiquette and, and performance. <coughs> and just the part about once your works are out there and they're published and they're distributed and you know we got all this stuff and you understand your copyright stuff. And then, so ha what are ways of promoting yourself and, and doing it in a way that's not going to make people immediately dump your emails auto into the auto junk folder, right? Your, or, or anything about you or block you on Facebook. Um, I think, and we touched on this before, certainly you know, any goal with a flounder in its mouth is a winning uh, image <laughs> for self-promotion, I have found. But um, I, th I think the more human that we make ourselves, the more effective our marketing is. And I, I, I feel that, I said this earlier today, you know, when I see just the standard announcements, really boring emails of you know, just the concert, the place, the time, the date, you know, and somebody insisting or begging that, that we all come, that doesn't quite get, get me going, you know? <laughs> I mean, I might want to go to the concert anyway for their music, but that's not going to be why. And I just think, there are creative ways that you can all figure out to be humorous, charming, interesting, quirky, bizarre, something that's just different that gets people's attention in a, in a weird way or in a clever way or some charming way. Or in a way that when you post something on Facebook, it should be something that other people somehow are going to benefit from, for instance. Um, you know, like, let me give you an example of how I use Facebook, and I'm not saying it's the way you all should use it. I'm just going to show you an example. My, for me, the Facebook page is, I'd say, two-thirds or more um, uh, nature and my life, just really puns and nature and silliness, and maybe one-third or less um, professional announcements. So working backwards, um, you know, there's a, I start, uh, my, head, my timeline photo is always some cool picture, you know, that I shot, and then I rotate out my Picture, my profile pictures. This one, of course, two days ago was um, two days ago was uh, Throwback Thursday, and people seem to like this one, so I kept it up there. <laughs> but uh, so there's me. Um, so here's something you know, business thing, uh, and I try to be you know sweet about it. Oh, it's you know. So here's a link to uh, obviously Throng is headed here clearly. Um, but anyway, I put it up here, and and got some nice things, and there's the pictures. So that's a silly thing. 
and then, whoop, I'm scrolling too fast, my apologies. Then I put, before that, I put a link to my latest blog post, which embarrassing composer car secrets re re revealed here. And guess what? I don't think there's, I mean, it says at the end of that blog post, the whole blog post, hold on, just to show you interconnectivity, just giving you some ideas. That is clearly not about music. That is about moss growing on my car, okay? <laughs> and it's all, it's all about the Pacific Northwest, and there's an otter doing a face palm, and more crap growing on my car, and oh my god, lichens are growing on my car. Yes, my car is rapidly becoming a chia pet. And another face palm from the sea lion, and my cat is face palming. And so basically, it's all about sort of this quirky little post about you know, the Pacific Northwest and all this stuff, right? and how I hold up like a hermit. And, and basically, only at the end, only at the very end do I say, you know, I, I talk about a rolling stone gathers no moss, but a working composer might end up like her car if she isn't careful, because I had just talked about how I hold up right, you know, writing a piece. And I just say, there are a lot of musical notes sprouting up, and I've been tending to the garden of muses with great care, which is a lot more than I can say for how I tend to my portuary among wheels. You know, so it's like I'm reminding the readers that I'm a composer, not that they don't know that. Uh, but the, the piece is not about composing or music or art. It's about island-colored cars <laughs> and, you know, the silliness of the Northwest. But one thing that I do on every one of my posts, click to listen. Look, there's an MP3. And so people click and they listen to the music, in which case it's a jazz piece I think I put up here, um, which is not... We don't hear, but it's okay, we don't have to hear it. But anyway, you get the idea. And then info about the music, so if they like what they hear, there's a link to the page on my website where they can learn more about it. Groovy, right? So it's my subtle way of promoting as a composer without ever putting it in anybody's face, because if they decide not to click, whatever, they're still gonna get a reasonably amusing post about this. Um, back to Facebook. The post before that. Here we are. I've got a fire in a wood stove reflected in my window. I've got a fox on the other side of the window. Therefore, I have a good web browser. <laughs> People like this one. <laughs> I mean, does that have anything to do with my life as a person? <coughs> Nothing. However, what does it do? It brings people to my doorstep. Who doesn't love a cute fox, I ask, right? And, you know, it's, it's just a funny picture. I, um, and, and then right after that, another post of a, of a, um, of a performer premiere. And then before that, cute fox. Fox sues. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that got lots of responses. And then another, you know, performance. And I'm always saying something nice about performers, amazing musicians, whatever. And I'm saying, I'm trying to be light at hard. And then some, sometimes something serious. This was my father's obituary in the New York Times from many years ago, but he, he, his birthday was better than his day. <coughs> and um, and then, of course, as you know, we moved totally without the internet for uh, five days, and so that was interesting. So I posted this picture, <laughs> how appropriate, of the atoll off of where I live, because that's pretty much the Gilligan's Island theme. Um, so you get the idea. It's sort of a more composing approach to posting things like this. I, you know, I got up, I opened the front door, and the box said, ding, 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 By, and I suggest to you that by bringing people into your life a little bit, and that doesn't mean you nowhere does it talk about my personal life. Right? Nobody knows anything about my personal life or anything about anything, but they feel like they do. And that's a very key thing. I'm bringing them into me as a person, into my sense of humor, which is pretty goofy, into my love of animals showing up trick-or-treating at my door. Um, I think, actually, I think that one was a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and, and, there's, there's this connectivity, and I think that one of the reasons that I was able to, you know, to get my music out there is because I got my pers personality out there, even though I live in the middle of nowhere, and most of the people um, that buy my music have never met. So it's just a thought that in your, in your website, you can make yourself personal. Let me give you another example. You see my blog, my Facebook. We go back to the website. My bio page. I get so tired of boring bios. I really do. And finally, I just decided to do something about it. Not totally outside of the box. There's nothing striking about this. But I, I have, you know, I give on the, on the bio page, I have right up here in the front. See, look for, looking for a short program bio or press kit? Here it is. Make things really easy for the people programming your music. You 
click and you get right here to two versions of a program <coughs> bio, to a press picture, to my uh, CV. This is all under the Be Prepared. This is the stuff you guys need. So make a note. <laughs> a narrative bio, a CV, a press photo, uh, program notes for any of your pieces. This, of course, links to my works page so they can find the piece. And each one of those um, links has a program note on it. Um, my catalog, activist music catalog. And then where I can be hired for speaking gigs and stuff, because I do that. Um, so here, they can go to my catalog. Ta-da! And there's, there's the whole lovely catalog. I don't know what catalog it is. There we go. We scroll down, and all this can be printed out. So you've got this interminably, ridiculously long thing. And the catalog, you know, you should all have one, listing all the publishing information about each one of your pieces. I do mine chronologically. Um, and then at the end, I've got a discography. So all the CDs are here, commercially released stuff, right? You should have, as you gain recordings or have them, you know, you should have this. So that's that. Um, and going back <coughs> to the bio. So I made it really easy for somebody to find those things immediately, because that's what people need when you're you know, working and doing this. And my overview. Composer Alex Shapiro lines note after note with the hope that at least a few of them might actually sound good next to each other. Her persistence at this activity, as well as at nonfiction writing, public speaking, wildlife photography, and the shameless instigation of insufferable puns on Facebook, has led to a happy life. You know, I'm making it clear that yes, I have a lot of important stuff to share here, and I do get to it. But I don't take myself that seriously, and I'm so tired of all of our fellow artists who do. You know, this is what we do is joyous. It should be joyous. If you're not having a good time doing this, don't do it. That's my motto. It should be fun. Well, this is not brain surgery. No one is going to die <laughs> if we don't play the piece right or we'll write the most perfect piece. No one's going to die most of the time. So, <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like just invite people in. Yeah. I, was, I feel like I'm asking too many questions. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I was going to ask, did, did you get the Dave Jarvis? Pizza. Yeah. I, oh, I, I have. Thank you for asking. I. Um, it's so funny. I just got sent the final mastered mix two days ago. Awesome. So all I have up is a is a, is a demo of it. But this is um, a piece uh, for timpani and electronics. Well, mixed percussion and electronics. Um, that looks like this. It's, it's it's really great setup. But anyway, so so here's like I put, put a little introduction so they can stop right there. And then if they're really interested, you know, they're going to keep reading. So here's my studies. Here's my geography, and all of it is a little bit light, but it's, you know, in, in tone. But it's, um, and you can go online and read it. But, you know, it, it, it gives you the idea of how I've done a bio that actually, you know, has a fair amount of stuff in it. So there's the stuff they can read. And then you keep going down, and I've obviously laid out the page in a way that keeps people scrolling. It's got multimedia, so I've got videos, all these videos and things you can, and radio things you can click on, okay, things you can read, all of it's clickable. Oh my God, she's talking again. You know, so you get the idea. All the CDs are clickable, and there's MP3s to listen to. You know, so I make it as interactive as I can, because that's the nature of the web. It's not just one way, it's two way. People want to click. It's sort of like those um, crib toys that babies have, you know, where you poke at all the stuff. I don't have any kids, so I don't know what I'm going to go from that, but I've seen them, and they look cool. I want one next to my bed, basically. That would keep me entertained. Anyway, so um, so there you go. That's um, an approach to using the web in a way that promotes not only your music but your persona. Because every one of you has something that you really love, that you really find interesting, and um, that's what you want to do. So connect people. What questions do you have before I continue to plow through stuff? So, you guys are so quiet. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever broken any of those copyright laws that you just mentioned to us? 